bringing home five NFL titles in seven years, unheard of, hasn't happened before or since. He was a tough football coach. He de demanded excellence at, at every position. To sacrifice, to be prepared, to be committed, to run with discipline. He was just an emotional guy. He was a great speaker. I didn't know that much about Lombardi, but I did know a lot about the Green Bay Packers and they were the world champions. And that's what I wanted to be part of. If you do it my way, we will win. And if you don't want to do it my way, we'll get somebody here that does. Gentlemen, this is the most important play we have. The play we must make go. When Vince Lombardi came to town, there wasn't great excitement about it. There was a heck of a resurrection job that he had to do to get the franchise back up on top. Following an exhaustive six-week search, the Green Bay Packers announced the hiring of Vincent Thomas Lombardi, head coach and general manager. His only head coaching experience was at St. Cecilia High School in Englewood, New Jersey. Who is this Lombardi? We, we didn't know him, and nobody knew who he, who he was. So he, I think he, he convinced us by being himself. He was uh, 45 years old when he got the job. Back in those days, that was also getting to the point where, oh, maybe he's not going to have the opportunity to get a head job. Lombardi was waiting for a head coaching job, and somewhat impatiently. You know, almost gave up coaching and went into banking because he thought he'd never get his shot. I was status quo as far as the Giants were concerned. I wasn't going to be satisfied as an assistant coach, and I wanted to be a head coach of a professional football team, and Green Bay gave me the chance to be one. Vince Jr. will tell you a lot of it had to do, he thought, with his dad's uh, Italian heritage and the fact that he was subjected to uh, prejudice both growing up, and then he believed that was one of the reasons he never really got a shot at being, becoming a head coach. If you know anything about Vince's history, he didn't have an easy gig wherever he was. He grew up in a family that was faith-oriented and Catholic family. At one point, he thought he was going to be a priest. He was educated by the Jesuits. Uh, he he uh, went to Fordham. He was, he was very, very religious. My father and Vince Lombardi went way back. They were classmates uh, together at Fordham University. He'd been an assistant coach at West Point, an assistant coach with the Giants. He was our offensive coordinator in, in the late uh, 1950s, and uh, Tom Landry was the defensive coordinator. Probably the best pair of coordinators that anybody has ever had. He loved New York. I mean, Vince was a New Yorker. And there was a large Italian community, of course, and Vince was part of that community. Jack Venisi knew who he was. Venisi, whose name ends in I, like Lombardi, they were fellow Italians. Jack Venisi played an influential role because he was well-connected around the league. Lombardi trusted Jack. He saw a sincere person. Jack got Lombardi to throw his hat in the ring. Dominic Olenicek called my father to ask if, if uh, he would give permission to hire Vince Lombardi. Dominic Olenicek was president of the team. They really didn't know they were gonna hire somebody who would become such a coaching legend. There was only 12 teams in the NFL at the time Lombardi became the coach here. That's a pretty high profile job. No question, Vince going to Green Bay ended up, in terms of the National Football League, it was a, it was a huge, huge thing. Lombardi set a new tone from the beginning. When introduced to the press and the Packers board, he delivers two memorable pronouncements. I want it understood that I am in complete command and I've never been associated with a loser, and I don't expect to be now. What I love about when Lombardi comes on the scene is he makes no bones about it. He's in control. He just commanded respect. I'd like to welcome you all, of course, and tell you how proud we are to have you a part of the Packers. Just as you should be proud to be, to be here, to be a part of this team. He knows it's his shot that he's waited for a long time, and he's not going to blow it by doing it someone else's way. One thing about the Packers, it's a team with a great tradition, 
that glory that is the Packers has been developed to one thing only, and that's pride. Everybody has ability. But pride in performance is what makes the difference. Now, how do you develop pride? Pride is developed by a winning tradition. He could uh, come into a room, and he was the one that everybody looked up to. Vince would get up, make his point in that big voice, and then he would sit down. This is a tough and it's a cruel business. And when we lose, we're gone. Therefore, we have to win. Therefore, you have to win. And we only want winners. When the coach spoke and gave his opinion, uh, it changed, it changed uh, other people's minds. He looked straight at people when he talked to them. This is not a timid guy. Winning, uh, <laughs> well, I think it's only natural that anyone would think that to win is, uh, is important. That's the reason you're in this business. If you have any kind of pride or any kind of dedication or any kind of backbone or spunk to you, you should try to be the best. And the best, again, is signified by winning. By spring, the Packers complete its reorganization. Shift authority for the team's operations from the executive committee to general manager Vince Lombardi. The organization finally realized that we can't have so many people thinking that they're going to have input and run the organization. He was not going to have to answer to these people that had interfered with the previous coaches. There's one person in charge, and it's Vince Lombardi. Vince, who is general manager, coach, and everything else in Green Bay. The whole point is, is he was in control of everything. Everything. There were football coaches at the time that sold insurance and had real estate investments and other kinds of distractions. He was 100% football. He made changes right away. He made changes administratively in his staff and in the building. At a first-ever kickoff dinner in August, Lombardi introduces each player, all of whom wear suits and ties. Lombardi tells those on hand, this is your team. It belongs to the city of Green Bay. Without you, we can do nothing. He wanted them to be like the New York Yankees. That's why he had them wear uh, white shirts and sport coats. He had us believe that in order to play well, you had to look well and act well and talk well. And that was all part of the game, being a professional in every phase of your life. His character was uh, highest. And he expected his players to have great character, too. We played in County Stadium, and I picked it. And I ran it back, and I scored. I slammed the ball to the ground, hit the ball, bounced, and bounced into the stands. I ran to the sideline. I'm just happy as hell. And Vince stopped me on the sideline. I said, don't you ever do that again. <laughs> That's what? But I realized that was not his way. He had certain standards, both physical and moral. They had teen bars when you were 18 years old. And I, I went there because I wasn't 21. And so Lombardi says, um, he's having roll call. You know, George, here, Czar, here, Fleming. Oh, by the way, Fleming, stay out of the, the teen bars. The babysitters are seeing you. I said, well, um, I'm not old enough to go to the big places. So he says, stay home then. We, we began to realize that the values we were accumulating that were not only good for our play on the field, but good for our lives. I didn't want to embarrass the Green Bay Packers. I didn't want to embarrass the town of Green Bay or Vince Lombardi. By striving for absolute perfection, you raise yourself notches above what you may have been content to be. And I think this is the, the law that he governs himself with. At the start of his first training camp, Lombardi orders team president Dominic Olenicek to leave the room. Don't ever come into any meetings I'm having with my players. The first uh, meeting we had with Coach Lombardi, uh, was a kind of a sharp tone from him. I didn't come in and have a meeting with the players and say myself, I wonder what their morale is going to be. I wonder how they're going to accept me. That wasn't what I said to myself. They're going to have to accept me. I'm not worried about their morale. I'm worried about Vince Lombardi's morale. He starts out by saying, I've never been a loser, and I'm not about to start now. We knew from the outset that he was in command, a take-charge guy, and a guy that you couldn't fool around with. A lot of the men thought he's going to do the X's and the O's and, and tell us his strategy. He really talked about uh, more about the kind of men he wanted on his team, what he wanted to instill in them, what was important. You have three things in your life that are critical, your God, your family, and the Green Bay Packers. 
This was not somebody that you were to take lightly. If you didn't accept the, uh, his philosophies, uh, then you, you didn't play for the Green Bay Packers, you didn't play for Vince Lombardi. He said, look, you guys have floundered around. You've played the last couple of years, you're better than what you played. I'm going to make you play better. They did say there are planes and trains and buses leaving here every day, and some of you may be on them. If you're not willing to make the sacrifice, to pay the price, to put the team first, then get the hell out. He said, gentlemen, we're going to relentlessly chase perfection, knowing full well we won't catch it because nothing is perfect. But we are going to relentlessly, and that's how he blurted it, chase it because in the process, we will catch excellence. And he said, I'm not remotely interested in being just good. Holy mackerel, man, I was just up like this. I didn't even need a seat. And after that meeting, he called me over and kind of laughingly said, he says, you know, I didn't know if anybody's going to leave there or not. I said, we could have had no football players. But I said, coach, don't worry. You just grabbed them. You've got everyone where you want them. After the first time that he spent an hour with Bart Starr, Bart went to the pay phone and called his wife, Cherry, and said, we're going to win. You know, this guy is, knows how to do it. The practices were different than what they had been. The next day on the field, we worked to the point of exhaustion. There's no horsing around, no goofing around, and, uh, and it's all for the one goal, and that was to be a successful football organization. He would push you. And you have to learn to, to accept that. I don't think there's any difference uh, whether you uh, teach on the football field or whether you teach in the classroom. They're both exactly the same. If they understand, they'll do it and do it the right way. There were certain players that he would just descend upon. I mean, he would just jump all over. Jerry Kramer, Jimmy Taylor, me. He was just trying to motivate each and every player to their maximum performance, to be the best player they can be. He's very fiery in everything that he does, and I have been one player who especially have tried to stay out of that realm of where usually it irritates him most. Being tough, I think, is, a, is an easy way of saying that he's been a, a disciplinarian and an organizer and a perfectionist. There were some players that could handle it, some players that were too sensitive to criticism and couldn't handle it, and so he treated them differently. It was a joy to be in meetings with him, not only on the field, watching him demonstrate or illustrate a point, but in meetings, the way he taught. With Bart Starr, he, he didn't admonish him in front of the team. I told him, I said, look, coach, I said, I can take all of the chewing you want to dish out. And I said, I understand your personality, and that's all well and good. And I said, that doesn't bother me. But what does bother me is the fact that you're telling the team one thing, that you're expecting certain things of your leaders, of your quarterbacks, and you expect me to go out there and lead them. I said, I can't do that if you're gonna chew me out in front of them. I said, now if I've got a chewing out coming, fine, but do it in the privacy of this office where you apologize to me when you know you're wrong. Otherwise, don't ever expect me to go out there and be your leader. And he never, ever raised his voice to me again. The summer of training was an experience, you, you can't describe it. I, I think I quit, camp, I quit the Packers every summer that I went to camp, and I think there were a lot of people with me. This is a, the true test of any man. It's when he faces adversity. When you get knocked down, what do you do when you get up? You have to get up, and you have to respond. Fatigue makes cowards of us all. You can't play fatigued. Therefore, it's up to you to be in prime physical condition. He was putting your, your uh, mindset in the fourth quarter of the game. He wanted you to be able to perform in the fourth quarter of the game. Henry Jordan years ago said, you know, somebody asked him, well, how does Lombardi treat you guys? He says he treats us all the same, like dogs. Are you turning out or are you running a dumb horse to drag out? Us? All you got to do is turn out. One day we're having a scrimmage, August, hot. 98 degrees. He was a tough football coach. He demanded excellence at, at every position. If you didn't give him your absolute best, your ass was out of there. I miss a block, and about four plays later, I jump off sides. He comes running across the field, 
gets about 10 inches from my nose. He says, Mr. The concentration period of a college student's five minutes, high school is three minutes, kindergarten is 30 seconds, and you don't have that? So where's that put you? I went up to the locker room, sat there looking at the floor, wondering what I was going to do with the rest of my life. Some people are born with a tremendous amount of leadership ability. You cannot do it by the book. You cannot coach an NFL football team by the book. He walks down and pats me on the back of the neck and messes up my hair a little bit. And he said, son, one of these days, you're going to be the best guard in football. You sat there and you'd cuss under your breath at him and say, you son of a man. You know, we take quite a bit, but uh, being grown men, uh, we realize that's the only way he can get the best out of us. And as long as uh, he does the same with Paul Horning and Bart Starr, he sure is welcome to do it with me. You knew what your body can do and you knew what your mind would do and it wouldn't give up in this critical instance. He starts preaching. He starts saying, there'll be a game this year in the fourth quarter when you will be, because of your superior conditioning, you will be the champions. The Packers' first season opener under Lombardi. Green Bay hosts the rival Chicago Bears. They hadn't beaten the Bears very often during the 50s. We were behind throughout much of the game. Six to nothing, the Bears had kicked a couple field goals, but late in the game, fourth quarter, we punted and Richie Pettibone and the Bears fumbled right around the Bears 20 yard line. They come back in the fourth quarter, probably because they're conditioning after a really tough training camp. We drove in and uh, Jim Taylor scored the touchdown. We're up seven to six. We kicked to the Bears, had them backed up to their end zone for a safety. They went at nine to six. Right there, these Chicago Bears, one of the more successful teams, are basically shut down and held in check. The players picked Lombardi up and carried him off the field. After all the berating, after all he had done to drive them to no ends during training camp, the players celebrated by lifting him up on their shoulders and carrying him to the locker room. Just elated to, to beat the devil here. I'm just a very, very, very happy man today. Did you, uh, did you feel that uh, the club did a real good job for you today, Vince, Out, nine to six win? Outstanding, I thought. And, if you can beat the Bears, you could probably beat any other team in the league. We went out and won our first three games. And here's a team that only won one game the year before. There was a lot of hope and optimism. It was Marie Lombardi who told Father DePaul that their stay here would depend on one thing. She said, Father DePoe, it all depends on one little word, win, win, win. But then we lost five in a row. We played some good football in there. Turn it around at the end, we won the last four. We beat the 49ers and we beat the Rams. When you have results like that, it doesn't take that long to have the public on your side. That made us a seven and five football team. Packers hadn't had a winning year in years. It is a dramatic turnaround from their previous one-win season. Vince Lombardi is named NFL Coach of the Year by the Associated Press. He can make you better, and he made the team play better. He took a, a team that nobody thought could ever come close to winning again and turned it around in one year. Green Bay gave Vince Lombardi an opportunity. He stepped into a, a perfect situation here because of the talent that was on hand. Lombardi taught them how to win and the sacrifices they would need to make to win big. At the start of the 1960 season, there are just over 60,000 people living in Green Bay. After a promising first season under Lombardi, continued success depends on trusting this very different kind of leader. Volatile, intolerant of mistakes, strict disciplinarian, all business. Well, the act too slow getting in there. Man, that is man, that is man. Way the hell back here, you never get to the hole. He was obsessed with winning, but it was not the only thing. Striving for perfection was the only thing. His message was simple, clear. You don't do things right now and again. You do it right all the time. 
We uh, won a game, but we won it in the last seconds in a field goal. And he just ripped us up one side and down the other. And he got so angry, he kicked a garbage can. He just hauled off and kicked it and hurt his toe. So he's hopping around the... <laughs> hopping around the locker room and we're about ready to die laughing and he's very angry. He never lied to us. He never played mind games. He could convince you that you could be good, but he had to believe it. You had to show him that you had what he wanted to play on his football team. He said, I know I won't have always the best players in everything, but I want to take them and bring out their talents, bring out their strengths and hone them, develop them to the utmost. He always knew how to let the players feel that his motivations were not for his own self-aggrandizement, but for the betterment of the team. He never demanded more of anyone than he demanded of himself. That's what great leaders do. Vince Lombardi was everything that anybody ever said about him, and then some. And this great pride that we do have in being part of a, a winning team, and. I think it all stems down from Lombardi. He hates to lose. A strong and promising team emerges. The big word in professional football is execution. All players succeed on the blackboard, but men make them work. They were a team of characters. God knows they were, but they also were a team of high character. Outstanding offensive line. He had big receivers and Horning and Taylor as running backs. Lombardi always talked about Horning as the best player he ever saw inside the 10 yard line. He could smell the goal line. One of my few book reports I ever did in my life, and I, I really mean few, was one was on Paul Horning. I didn't know exactly where Green Bay was, but I knew it was up north and I knew it was cold, but I knew that there was tremendous history and greatness. He won the Heisman Trophy in 1956 on a team that went two and eight. That's never happened before and it won't happen again. He had been a college quarterback, that's how he won the Heisman Trophy but they couldn't find a position for him. He was tried at fullback, halfback, quarterback. They didn't quite know where he should play, where he would be best served. Lombardi came in, he said, you're my halfback. He really adored this boy. He said he was as close to him as any ball player ever coached. He was, um, he was, he was nearest the heart. You've got the coach on your side rooting for you to be the best you can be. That goes a long way to helping you maximize your skills. Fuzzy Thurston, who played left guard, I mean, he wasn't a Hall of Famer, but he did a hell of a job. Seeing Fuzzy Thurston and Jerry Kramer pull out and lead Paul Horning or Jimmy Taylor around the right or left end. Paul Horning and, and the way he played the game and Jim Taylor's toughness and tenacity. An outstanding defensive tackle, Henry Jordan provides consistent and relentless pressure as an inside pass rusher. He is named All-Pro for five straight seasons. Louis Davis was a very fine defensive end. They called me Dr. Feelgood. It was because of my attitude, personality, and many times the, 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 the fun, loving part of, even in practice, I would run around a lot of time laughing. Absolutely a fabulous athlete and an even better human being. Walking out of the dorm one night and this voice comes out of the darkness, Bill, I thought it was God. I'm terrified. It was Willie Davis. He said, I'd like to speak with you. And I said, oh, no, this is it. He's going to tell me to go home. He said, I've been watching you at practice. I think you've got a chance to make our team. And I'm going to help you. When Nitschke's snapping your face mask and breaking your nose, and Lombardi's screaming in your face, and you don't think you can take another step, you look at me, and I'll get you through it. It was an unexpected, undeserved, unrewarded act of kindness by a great leader and a great man if you got Willie Davis, nobody can beat you. Ray Nitschke in the linebacking core, he kind of tied everything together. If you know Ray Nitschke, you'd think he just walked up to you, think he's an accountant or businessman or something. It was just meek and mild as could be. But when he stepped on the football field, there was a metamorphosis. He changed like a Dr. Jekyll and Hyde. He became something else. He became Ray Nitschke, number 66 of the Green Bay Packers, and he would hit. The first year was tough for me, just getting acclimated to the small town of Green Bay and 
coming from Chicago, you know, and Chicago, we didn't know our neighbors. You know, in Green Bay, you play for the Packers, everybody knew you. His forearm broke my nose and my face mask and my chin strap. The question uh, became, would I drive my face into that forearm again? And that's where I faced the reality of the National Football League. To me, in my mind, he was the best football player we had on that team. When you went to Blognitsky, uh, you know you had to scrimmage. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, you might get one of those big forearms in your teeth and, uh, and come off with your, your ears ringing. Forrest Gregg, for heaven's sakes, probably the best offensive lineman, not only in our day, but in the whole league. Her rally was uh, an outstanding athlete. Combination of strength, speed, leadership. He had it all. He was a full package. Willie Wood, he had to uh, write letters to get a tryout. He wrote to all the teams. And Jack Manisi was one that said, yes, come on in. Probably the best tackler that uh, we had in the 60s. Smaller guy, but tenacious, and a guy that just gave us heart. Jim Ringo was a great center. Ringo was tough, and Ringo played hurt. Lombardi liked that. You could play hurt, then you really went up in the estimation of Coach Lombardi. Bart Starr, this sort of cerebral leader of the team. He's perfect for Lombardi. Well, that's good. They didn't. He would take the game plan as Lombardi would lay it out. There's no communication with the quarterback from the sidelines. There's no signals, anything else. Bart called his own game based on the preparation that uh, Lombardi gave him. The coaches in the booth, they never sent a play in. We got in the huddle, 11 guys, many of them the same for 11 years, and he never made a bad call. And Bart's smart, and he always was smart, and Lombardi took advantage of that. The team continues to improve under the strict discipline of Lombardi. Let's go. Good job. Lombardi gave that group of Packers, that difference, that, that little push, that little uh, fire branding that made them champions. He brought them to the next level. That's the definition of a great coach is, can you get the most out of his personnel, the most out of his players, the most out of his coaches? Just as the Packers start to gain success, the organization suffers a terrible loss. Jack Venisi, 23 years old when he got the job, Jack would be working so hard. He was working late, early. He developed rheumatic fever when he was in the service, before he came to the Packers. Died of a heart attack at the age of 33. It was taken pretty hard by everybody because he was such a young guy and had such a talent and such a future. The great tragedy of Jack's life is that the Packers in 1960 were moving toward what would become their first great season. He really was just starting to see the fruits of his labor. He had put this team together. There are people that are written out of history, and I often say that it's my responsibility to write them back into history, and that's what I tried to do with Jack Venisi. It was a pretty somber time. Players were pretty close to Jack. It was a beautiful funeral, and everybody was there. I mean, unbelievable. The Packers finish out the regular season, ending on a high note. We had to go out to the West Coast to play San Francisco, and we won that game 13 to nothing in the mud. If we win the game the next week against the Rams, we would have the championship. December 17, 1960. The Packers prevail in one of the tightest races in NFL history, winning the Western Conference Championship. With a pitch to Max McGee. Mack, that's the stretch to pull in the ball, but he keeps his balance long enough to slide in for the score. Beating the Los Angeles Rams 35-21 at LA's historic Memorial Coliseum, the Packers win their first title in 16 years and their first under second-year head coach, Vince Lombardi. 
More than 11,000 fans greet the team upon its arrival at the airport. This becomes a tradition following big road victories. People would get caught up in the enthusiasm of the game and uh, the team's coming back and they'd report on the radio, television, the team will be back home at 9:10 tonight. So let's see you out at the airport. Welcome the team home. I know that you've talked about the team being extremely fatigued. Uh, how do they feel now that it's all over for the regular part of the season? Well, I don't know, I don't know yet, uh, uh, actually. I think we're all right, though. We're much more relaxed than we were. Uh, how, how are we physically? Fine. Good shape. Very good, and again, congratulations on a job well done. Now we're playing for the championship for the first time. We get down to about the 30-yard line. If we score, we win the game. Only seconds go, no timeouts left, and Bart threw a little flare pass to Jim Taylor, who ran it down about to the nine-yard line. He was tackled by Chuck Bednarik of the Eagles. Bednarik wouldn't let him get up. Just kind of sat on him, let the clock tick down. Victory goes to the Eagles. A team that has overcome insurmountable odds all season, the Philadelphia Eagles are truly a team of desire. This is our first championship for a lot of guys, so it was a really difficult game to lose. We all came in the locker room and we, we all were disappointed. Coach had been out doing uh, interviews with the press and he comes into the locker room about 10 minutes late and he gets up on a trunk full of capes and stuff. Bring it up! Everybody up! Bring it up! We get up in front of the room, in the locker room. He said, we got B today. But he said, I can tell you right now, it won't ever happen again. He says this to us right after the ball game. It won't ever happen again. No one will ever beat us in a championship game again. At that moment, I became a, a Lombardi fan. Internally, it killed him. Uh, every defeat was like a death for Vince Lombardi. And he'd just play over and over and over again in his mind every play that could have led to that defeat. That was part of his obsession. Despite losing the championship, the Packers end a successful second season under Lombardi with an 8-4 record. The best is yet to come. What Coach Lombardi did was bring everybody together as a team where everybody was playing as one. He told us very early, you are good enough to win, but we have to be disciplined. We have to do it our way. Before the start of the 61 season, Coach Lombardi makes the announcement. The Packers have sold out their home games on a season ticket basis for the first time since offering them. This came the same year 6,591 seats were added in the first expansion of City Stadium, raising the capacity to over 38,000. In an early October game, Paul Horning scores a Packers record 33 points with four touchdowns, one field goal, and six extra points. A 45-7 victory over the Baltimore Colts. When Lombardi was hired, Horning was ready to quit because his first two seasons had been so frustrated. His 33 points in one game still stands as a team record. Horning becomes the MVP of the league. He becomes the MVP of the 1961 championship game. And Lombardi calls him one of the greatest clutch players to ever play the game, the greatest player he ever coached. The Packers clinch the Western Conference and secure the 1961 NFL Championship game. Cold weather, got the big city Giants coming here to play us, so big build up to that game. The 61 Championship, to this day, was the most eagerly anticipated game in the history of the Green Bay Packers. It was the first time they played host to the NFL Championship game. And there's nothing bigger in the eyes of fans than a first. The path to the championship had been anything but clear-cut. NFL players are called into service as the Berlin crisis rages on. The whole team was having a good year. and We got called up in the middle of the season. People that were in the National Guard, the Army Reserve, had to serve. Paul Horning, Ray Nitschke, and myself. I was in Fort Riley, Kansas. And they were letting all the football players in the NFL, every one of us, 
got weekend passes to certain games we could go back and play. Didn't always get passes to come home and play for games. Here comes the championship game. Guy says, Paul, you can't go this weekend. General said, all leaves are out. Everybody stays home. I go, coach, yes, Paul, I I won't be able to make it for the championship game. What? What the hell are you talking about? He said, I got Kennedy's number in my pocket. I'm going to call him when we hang up. He said, America deserves to have the best game that they can have in the championship game. The Packers need Paul Horning to play to be a part of their team. I get the pass. December 31st, 1961. Green Bay Packers versus the New York Giants. Former Packers head coach Curly Lambeau visits the press box at halftime. Now the Giants made a lot of mistakes. They're trying hard to make mistakes, and the Packers are a red hot ball club and have made no mistakes. Now who can tell what will happen this half? The Packers overwhelm the New York Giants 37 to nothing to win the franchise's seventh NFL championship. It's first in 17 seasons. He had the dominant defense under Lombardi with Willie Davis and Wood. And, and then you had some zany, unconventional characters but who were also great players, Ray Nitschke and Max and Horning. So it was a combination of factors all underneath Vince. Lombardi brought back not only the pride in the state of Wisconsin, but the pride around the country. Green Bay being such a small town and being able to have a championship team there has captivated the nation. The 1962 Packers run to daylight and lead the league in scoring for a second straight season. All right, gentlemen, I would say that the number one play in our offensive category is the, is the power sweep. This is what we call running to daylight. Daylight, wherever it shows. Inside the defensive tackle, inside the defensive end, inside the defensive linebacker, that play could break any one of those three places, besides, of course, the ideal place, which is outside the defensive linebacker. This is the most important play we have. It's the play we must make go. It's the play that we will make go. And it's the play that we will run again and again and again. 49-28. The fullback was a lead blocker to the right. The left halfback was on the left side, the weak side of the offense. And Horning was the guy who ran it. I ran the football behind Ron Kramer, who's lined up on the right side. And we were running the sweep to the right. Or Ron was in the tight end position on the left side of the line. We'd run the sweep back to the left side. That was our best play. If I get up and I feel a little grouchy and everything, I want to go out there and hit people. Uh, It's not a friendly game, and uh, it never will be a friendly game. You can't go out there and have parties. You know, it's a a real hard, rough, tough uh, football game. People think that Lombardi had a simplistic offense, but in fact, every player on that team knew the different ways to respond depending on what the defense was doing on that one play. He was extremely intelligent with his game. Offensively, uh, he worked with the offense a great deal of the time, and... His explanation of the key plays were so convincing that when he finished them, I don't think there was ever anybody in the room who thought that we couldn't make that thing go against any situation. He also had what was called a weak side sweep. Not as probably famous as the one with the the guards coming to the strong side with the tight end, but it was still a changeup. It would be me blocking the defensive end on the left side. You still had Horning and Taylor, and they just would run to, depending where the tight end lined up, they would run it to the other side. Let's say we're going to line up right. Taylor's behind the right tackle. I'm behind the left tackle. I go block the defensive left end. Jimmy comes back to the weak side. Now we got the two guards pulling back to the weak side. The Packers were so well trained in that sweep that they were a few seconds ahead of the defense in, in their response time, which is everything in athletics. Nobody was unprotected going against the sweep. You were going to get blocked by somebody. And when you get to to a level where everybody does it the right way, you got success. November. The Packers face the Eagles in Philadelphia. That was a game that uh, Packers wanted revenge for losing the 60 championship game. We hadn't played them since then. And they went out there and really took it to Philadelphia. 
Tommy McDonald, who was a wide receiver for the Eagles, and made a comment to the press after the game. He says, I couldn't even make their rinky-dink team. <laughs> and he was he was a pretty good player, but he was just in awe of the Packer power that day. The Packers finished this season with a nearly flawless 13-1 record. Many consider the 1962 Packers the greatest team in franchise history. Team played 21 games that year, including the preseason, won 20 of them. The season culminates in a bitterly fought defensive battle in a just as bitterly cold Yankee Stadium. Wind chill was pretty low. It was um, bitter, cold, and uh, just hard-nosed football. And of course, Jim Taylor was a guy that the Giants were laying for. Robustelli and Cat Cavage and other different players that tried to tear my head off. You try and in return to bring the contact to them. The conditions of that day dictated a ground game. New York was more of a passing team, so I'm sure the conditions hurt them. The Associated Press announces Packers' Jim Taylor as the NFL's MVP. I got the ball and I'm dropping down and, and that sideline is right there. I'm not stepping out, I'm not stepping out. I'm taking on that New York Giant player. The Packers prevail 16-7 over the New York Giants, a title rematch to win their second straight NFL championship under Vince Lombardi. He was a difficult man in a difficult position and had a, a difficult job, and there were moments where he was tried and tested. So he went to church every day for the strength that he got from the religion and the belief in the church. Faith was extremely important to him, no question about that. No matter what he did, he did it 100% full throttle. He was a very religiously committed individual. He certainly found a way to use his faith, his religious teachings, and infuse them into football in essentially a non-religious way. He put these almost like commandments in the locker room. It was like the two tablets that Moses had. You get to believe the gospel of Lombardi when you, when you hear it time after time after time. We had a great faith in ourselves, a great belief in ourselves, and he was responsible for that. Lombardi, from the time he was a grade schooler in seventh grade, he always went to seven o'clock mass, wherever, or close to it, through high school, through college. His faith was private. He uh, went to Mass every morning at St. Willibrard Church because the offices then were on Washington Street, just a couple of blocks down. His desire to be a priest was part of his life, and so if he couldn't be a priest, he could live like a priest and believe like a priest. He based his whole pregame speech on run to win. I believe it was St. Paul's epistle. I'm not in the habit of quoting the scripture or gospel, but I was groping, I think, at the time for something in order to give my club a little bit of a lift. And there is a quote from St. Paul. Don't you know that while all the runners in a stadium are in a race, only one wins the prize, so run to win. And he went on to expound on that and say that we play not just to be playing. We're here not just to be here. That's not enough in itself. We play to win. The 1963 draft. The Packers put their faith in All-American Dave Robinson, their number one draft choice. I didn't go to school to play football. I went to school to get my degree. The only way to play football is because that was the only way I could get a scholarship. He was a bright kid, an engineering student. He got a great memory, active mind. Dave was a, one of the best defensive football players we've ever had. Herb and I played next to each other, and uh, Willie Davis played next to me, and, and uh, we caught at the strongest left side in the history of the National Football League. Inside support man was Ray Nischke, and when he went the wrong way, we had Wooly Wood as our safety guy. I've heard about Ray Nischke not wanting to miss a tackle because then Willie was going to have to make the tackle, and he'd have to answer to Willie, and he didn't want Willie on his case. You could get near the ball and look to your right at Lombardi's left side, and there would be five, count five future Hall of Famers on the field at one time and people just didn't attack our side. We had a very strong side. A lot of huddles and a lot of good times, isn't it, Willie? People you meet, man. That's right. And people you right. play with, people you're involved with, really have made it a wonderful experience. The Packers finished second in the Western Conference in 1963. 
an 11-2-1 record, despite some noteworthy obstacles. In 1963, I was with the Los Angeles Rams. I didn't know what had happened. Packers played St. Louis Cardinals then, and Bart broke his hand. The system that I had at Los Angeles was identical to the Packers. On October 30th, the Packers acquire quarterback Zeke Brakowski in what is recorded as a waiver deal. But there are suspicions that the deal was really a trade made after the deadline for a player to be named later. Coach Lombardi knew that I had the same system, so it was an easy transition for me. Vince always wanted to take care of everybody he knew. He comes to me and he said, you got any warm coats? I said, well, not really, coach. So he came in and he had this black raincoat that had the lining and the fuzzy lining in it. And he put that, he said, that fits good. <laughs> you know. Then he said, get a hat. 1963 was notable in other ways. NFL has a rule about gambling. They do not want the game connected with gambling. You know, I've always been a spender. I mean, everybody knows I was, even in those days, you know. Paul grew up going to the track when he was about six, seven years old. And so he grew up on an early age betting on horses. Paul Horning and Alex Kares were betting. Horning said he did not bet against the Packers. He was betting on the Packers. I was making a lot of money. And I was making money betting. <laughs> That's the worst thing that can happen to you. Pete Rozelle suspended Paul Horning for gambling. And at that time, you can imagine what a big story that was in the NFL. Naturally, we regretted it. I, it, was a, it was a very traumatic thing to be suspended without pay. And then you never know if you're going to get back into the league. Lombardi was very disappointed that this happened because Morning was sort of Lombardi's guy. To Lombardi's credit, he didn't turn his back on Paul Horning and say, you're never coming back here. He said, we're going to get you through this year and you'll be back with the Packers. It's going to take a long year and I'll be just very, very happy if I'm on my feet at the end of the season because I'm just Thrilled to death that I'll be able to play football again. In 1964, the Packers finish in second place for the second year in a row. They are again resigned to play in the playoff bowl. Lombardi, at the end of that season, said, it's the last time we're going to have a second place team. It's a toilet bowl. You're either first or you're last. Everything else means nothing. You wonder, is the dynasty over? June 1st, 1965. Curly Lambeau dies of a heart attack. He is 67. He was up at his girlfriend's house, Mary Jane Van Dyce, up in Sturgeon Bay. They were going out, and he stopped by to pick her up. I was a little late getting home, and, and so I said, I'm going upstairs to get my outfit on. Then he said that he was going to be talking with Fritz, my dad. Sometime he'd talk with my dad for hours about football and uh, and it was just, uh, he was one in a million. Her dad was cutting the grass up there, and Curly kind of saw him cutting the grass and said, hey, how about giving me a turn? So he grabbed the lawnmower and started cutting the grass. And uh, pretty soon he um, just dropped over into my dad's arms. He dropped out of a heart attack. There wouldn't have been a lot of media coverage of Lambeau's funeral. Curly had been removed from the Green Bay scene for 10, 15 years. Cal Hubbard said that they're going to have a hard time finding six men to bury him. And Hubbard was one of Lambeau's great players. Everybody knew that there was no love between Vince Lombardi and Curly Lambeau. Two extreme opposites in terms of personalities. Curly was a BS. Lombardi was a straightforward, no holds barred, honest person. He was on the cover of uh, the Packer Yearbook in 65, uh, shaking hands with Curly. Art Daly from the Press Gazette who put out the yearbook was told by Lombardi, that's the worst yearbook you ever put out. Vince didn't want to do it. 
And he didn't like it when it was on the yearbook, and no, he actually know. banned Dad from practice for, for several days. Several days. In August, the city council votes unanimously to rename Green Bay City Stadium Lambeau Field. Initially, stadium commission was opposed to the idea. The Packers were opposed to the idea. After a lot of argument and debate, they do eventually rename it Lambeau Field in honor. Vince Lombardi is furious. He didn't want to maybe acknowledge it. He, he, he would have, I'm sure, liked the stadium named after him. So he probably wasn't going to give it a lot of recognition. Why is it named Lambeau Field? It's named after the creator, Curly Lambeau. The only reason this stadium is named Lambeau Field today is because of the support fans threw behind the idea. September 11th, 1965. The dedication takes place during a preseason pregame ceremony. Don Lambeau, Curly's son, and Don Hudson, Lambeau's star end, address the crowd. Probably didn't last five minutes. No big deal. Um, many things were no big deal back then, but that was particularly so for something you'd expect a lot of pomp and pageantry. The 1965 season marks the first of three consecutive championship seasons. The 1965 Packers certainly weren't dominated. They went through a period during the midseason where they really struggled offensively. Paul Horning was hurt for much of the year. Uh, their offense wasn't what it was. Their defense was a little bit in transition. It was the veteran players with their experience that helped win that championship in 65. A lot of folks that can play the game a bit, they're big, they're fast, they're smart, they got a lot of tools. But the fire, it's a burn, it's a hunger, it's a drive, it's a want, it's a spark that makes a difference. It was maybe Lombardi's best coaching job. In the sixth game of the 1965 season, the Packers challenge the Colts in foggy Baltimore. We were only ahead by one point. They were going in for a touchdown and would have taken the lead. Quasi tried to lob the ball over my head. Well, you know, I, I was a basketball player. I could jump 10 feet easy. Lobs don't get it. So I jumped up and picked the ball and came down. He picked off a pass, ran 87 yards. I would have gone all the way. But Quasi was back there, and I slowed down, waiting for Nishki to come up and make the block. And Nishki just, he drug his feet. Swung that game around, and then we ended up winning fairly comfortably, 42-27. They beat the Colts, tie the 49ers. Packers stand 10-3-1, and one, tied for first place. The team to face the Colts again in a playoff game, this time at Lambeau Field. In the first half, the Packers gotten stopped on the one yard line and Lombardi was not happy and I wasn't far from where he was on the sideline and he's yelling to those players, What are you doing out there? Vince would stand over there and yell. If you were a good football player and you were not showing it, that's when he was perturbed. He would really go after you. Don Chandler ties the game with a 22 yard field goal with 158 left in regulation. The Colts, furious over the call, insist the kick floats wide right and outside the uprights. You know, the so-called field goal that everybody said that we didn't make. The ball was so high above the uprights, plus it was curving, it was difficult. And the goalpost was short and the ball came, kind of did a little. Films that were taken from this south end, it's difficult to tell, is that ball inside or outside the uprights? Obviously, Chandler did something that people thought he missed. He thought he missed it, but he did. I mean, the referee makes the signal, it's good. What are you going to do? It's good. 13 minutes, 39 seconds into sudden death overtime. Don Chandler kicks a 25-yard field goal to lift the Packers over the Colts 13 to 10. The Green Bay Packers are the champions of the Western Conference. Due to the end of game controversy, the NFL extends the uprights to 20 feet above the crossbar. The Packers played a wonderful game of football and are the champions of the Western Conference and will meet the Cleveland Browns for the World's Championship on January the 2nd. 1965 NFL Championship game. Green Bay sees five inches of wet, heavy snow. This snarls pregame traffic and the Cleveland Browns. 
they got delayed because of the weather, and they never got here until a little bit an hour before the game, so already they didn't get off on the, on the right foot. They must scramble to make kickoff. Cleveland had the great runner, Jimmy Brown. When we would play the Browns, they would always gear themselves to stop Jim Brown. And the sleet and the snow and the muck here at Lambeau Field, and that was to the advantage of Horning and Taylor. We were certainly not speed mergents, and to the disadvantage of Jim Brown, who was much faster. With their distinctive sure-footed styles, Packers 30-year-old running backs Paul Horning and Jim Taylor sloshed through a quagmire for a combined 201 yards rushing. That was Lombardi football. He just pounded the ball against the Browns that day. The Packers defeat the Browns 23-12 and win the 1965 NFL Championship. Horning and Taylor, nicknamed Thunder and Lightning, had done it again. It was just a couple of names that a couple of reporters thought up. Taylor and Horning were a good tandem. I never paid any attention to it, and I know Jimmy didn't either. He didn't care one way or the other. The world champs secure halfback Donnie Anderson in the 65 draft and fullback Jim Grabowski in 66. And Grabo and I both, we've talked about it a zillion times. We wanted to be a Green Bay Packer. We wanted to be the champions. Lombardi was more adaptable than people think. He could interchange players. He lost Horning and Taylor, and he came up with Grabowski and Anderson. Leroy Caffey made one of the funniest comments he said, we used to have uh, thunder and lightning, and now we have cloudy and drizzle. The Packers organization ushers in a new era of player compensation. Together, we signed a contract, which was pretty lucrative for the time, probably higher than anybody had done previous to that point. They gave us the name Goldust Twins, and, and it, reputedly it was a million dollars between us. He got more than I did, but that's okay. Um, so that's where the million-dollar backfield came from. At the time, it was a considerable amount of money. Seconds remain in the championship game. The Dallas Cowboys face a fourth and goal at the Green Bay two-yard line. Dallas had the momentum. It was not looking good for us, and we had to stop him. If I go and play it the way that Lombardi drew this play up, I'm going to stop the play. He's going to pull up. He's going to throw the pass again. Dave Robinson charges Cowboy quarterback Don Meredith. You can see the guard, he sees me, he wheels around and tries to come back to get me, but it's too late. Meredith takes the ball, rolls out to the right. He's going to be nailed. A pass away and it's intercepted in the end zone. On that last play, Dave Robinson was able to get in and get a hold of Meredith's arm. And I grabbed him, and he had his arm out like this. I, I hit him from the left side, and I couldn't get his right arm. I'm trying to pull it down. Meredith just flipped the ball because he's knowing he's going down. And of course, Tom Brown standing there, they will intercept and save the day for us. The play preserves a 34-27 victory and the 1966 NFL Championship. This time, the Packers have another game to play. The National Football League was the league, and uh, they'd worked hard to establish their league. The, the newfangled AFL uh, was a challenge to them. The AFL had signed a number of players off the NFL rosters. And it, was, it put the pinch on a lot of the NFL owners. Competition between the AFL teams and the NFL teams had gotten to the point where we weren't sure that all the teams uh, would survive. Following six years of hostile relations, the upstart American Football League and the nearly 50-year-old National Football League agreed to a merger. They want recognition. They want parity with the NFL. They win this game. Boy, that's a big feather in their hat. A lot of recognition. We're just as good as you are. Coach Lombardi was tense. Talk about tight as the nuts on a new bridge. He was really not himself. People were asking him questions about the Kansas City Chiefs and their, and their credentialing and their personnel. Lombardi had the edge because he had honed his team with mental toughness. We have to beat this team, too solidify what the NFL stands for. The Coliseum at the time filled, it was 100,000. There were only 65,000 people there. Even the pre-event stuff was, was fairly quiet. I don't know what the heck it was. They're trying to promote their, their television station, and they wanted these gals to come out on a trampoline with Coach Lombardi. And they said, would you mind? I said, yes, I would mind. <laughs> I will not do that. 
set up here. I got to take it down, fella. Known then as the AFL NFL World Championship game, it marks the first time teams from the two rival leagues play one another. It is now known as Super Bowl I. The game is played in LA's historic Memorial Coliseum. I did attend the very first Super Bowl in Los Angeles with my dad. I think the tickets were $8, and we were up pretty high in the Coliseum when the game started. And every quarter we moved down a little lower. I grew up watching highlights of uh, the Super Bowl. It was one of my favorite uh, VHS tapes. I wore that thing out. And it starts with Super Bowl I, which is us, Green Bay Packers, and the stories of Bart Starr. 34-year-old receiver Max McGee becomes the unlikely hero of the day. Max McGee uh, drinking the night before the game and then going out there and catching the first touchdown in Super Bowl history. The story goes that he was out all night. Max McGee said that it's time to go out and have some fun. He uh, told his roommate, I've got stu two stewardesses lined up. Uh, I'm going to go leave tonight. Uh, you're coming. Come on, I need you. i got two of them. I just had to go out and see the lights on Sunset Strip, so out I went. But Paul wouldn't go. Paul had a little more value of the money than I did. You know, I said, what the hell, it's a day's pay. McGee claims he played on little sleep, sneaking out of the team hotel following bed check for a night of carousing. The stuff of legends. Wasn't set to play, wasn't ready to play, all of a sudden got called on. Boy, Dollar gets hurt on like the first series. Hurts his shoulder out for the game. Lombardi yells about Max, and Max, he hadn't played all year, and uh, he can't find his helmet. And my God, someone gave him the wrong helmet. Anyway, put it on. Max McGee had the game of his life. I'm thinking, oh my God, this man's been out all night on the eve of the biggest game in our career. He catches seven passes for 138 yards and two touchdowns from game MVP, Bart Starr. At halftime, we were ahead 14 to 10. The first Super Bowl halftime show initiates today's tradition of spectacle. It features two men flying above the field propelled by rocket belts. While the show went smoothly, the return to the game did not. They sent Pat Summerall down because Pat had played for Vince in New York. He said, you need to go down and tell Vince that you need to kick off again because NBC was a commercial. So he says, you got to be crazy. I'm not going to do that. They said, get somebody else. He said, well, you played for him. So he goes over and Lombardi says, you got to be kidding me. I'll file suit against the NFL for this. So he agreed, not very happily about it, but he did agree. Green Bay dominates the second half. Safety Willie Wood's 50-yard interception return triggers the team's 21-point surge. The Packers make history by winning Super Bowl I, rolling to a 35-10 victory over the Kansas City Chiefs. Pressed to compare the Chiefs with teams in the NFL, at a post-game press conference, Coach Lombardi blurts out the comment many of his NFL brethren want to hear. Kansas City has a real top team, but I don't think it compares with the top teams in the NFL. That's what you wanted me to say. Now I've said it. We're going to win, and we're going to win with pride and discipline, and that's what makes the Green Bay Packers. After nine years, four NFL titles, and the first Super Bowl, the golden boy, Paul Horning, ends his Packers career. Lombardi announces Horning's number five will be retired. He made you understand that you were a better football player, you were a better team. So he pushed us to that level. I've always said that nobody pushed a team like he did. 1967. Lombardi is driving to win a third straight NFL championship while juggling head coach and GM duties. We played the Los Angeles Rams in, in the Coliseum three or four weeks before the uh, divisional championship game. Coach was adamant all that week about how important it was for us to win that game, even though we had already clinched the division. What happened with Vince Lombardi and often is a characteristic of human impulse is that the more success he had, the more he needed success. 
It leads to great accomplishments, but also to an ultimate sense of never feeling quite there. We played a hard game against the Rams. He was furious that we lost this game, furious. The thrill of, of victory was diminished and every defeat was enhanced greatly, so it became harder and harder for him. The Packers win the Central Division with a 9-4-1 record. However, they are perceived as tired and aging. Being an old man inferred that you were not capable of doing the job, that you had passed your prime, that you were no longer a great football player, you were a has-been. Underdogs for the first time in a home playoff game under Lombardi. A rematch, Packers versus the Los Angeles Rams in the NFL Western Conference Championship game. The playoff game at County Stadium against the Rams. I remember Travis Williams having a huge game. Travis Williams was our secret weapon in that game. He had all kinds of yards. He would try to close on him and he could run in between them. He was just so fast. The Packers faced the same adversary on the last day of 1967 as they did on the first. They beat the Dallas Cowboys on January 1st to earn their place in Super Bowl I. They must now face them again. Lombardi was the guy that kept everything in check. He would inspect the field. And then he had his uh, anti-freeze situation there where he installed a whole bunch of wires under the stadium floor, the turf, to uh, keep the field soft. He loved gadgets. He just absolutely loved things that he felt gave him a competitive advantage. This system would keep the, the soil from freezing and therefore make it playable. And so the night before the game, they turned it on. That night, the weather changed. <laughs> The weatherman made a terrible forecast. December 31st, 1967. Don Meredith uh, said they had a wake-up call at the hotel Holly Duty Packer Backer. He said, what? He said, Holly Duty at 7 o'clock in the morning at 16 below. And Meredith said, 16 below what? Your breath and your breathing was just absolutely like a cake of ice. Yesterday, Saturday before that Sunday game, was a beautiful day in Green Bay. It was maybe 20, 30 degrees, but hot, a bit sunny and beautiful. We were running around like a bunch of Colts out in the field. press box uh, on the west side of Lambeau uh, didn't have much heat in it at all, and I thought, wouldn't this be lovely? And the field uh, was another story. When they got to Lambeau Field, some of the Packers' coaches were down there. The grass was nice and soft and warm until they took the tarp off. And then it hit 16 below weather and it quick froze. You just see the white creeping across the field, the frozen tundra. And someone said, you better go up and tell your boss the system's not working. And none of the assistant coaches would do it. They got Chuck Lane. I'm next to the young brother. He gave him all the crappy jobs. So I go into to Lombardi and uh, said, coach, I guess we got a problem. What's that? He said, your field is frozen. He said, you're kidding me, you can't be. And I said, oh yeah, <laughs> it is, unfortunately. I thought you needed to know. Well, he just flew off the handle at that one. People start filing into the locker room, and there's a lot of grumbling going on. Yeah, I think it's great. You like it? No. <laughs> Coach heard that, too. He said, we're playing this game. So get out there, get warmed up, and let's go. Getting warmed up was impossible. Vince would let guys wear gloves, and Dave Robinson said, I'm going to wear a brown glove, and he won't know the difference. And my God, he did. By the time the game started, it was an ice rink. All the uh, mud to it, coagulated on the field, froze to the field. It was almost as if you had a stucco wall and you laid it down and then you had to play on that. The upper level was where the cameras were, so there couldn't be glass in front of the cameras. So for the entire game, we were literally outside. Every time a guy opened that damn door, it was like the Arctic Circle, coffee froze on the ledge. Guys wiping the windows with the keeps or the breath through, so you could see out the window. It was in terrible conditions. The first play of the game was almost a disaster. Donnie Anderson fumbled. You know, it was like trying to hold an ice cube. The referee blew the whistle. He tried to pull the whistle, which was a metal whistle. It stuck to his lip and he had to rip it out of his mouth. It cracked his lip and the blood froze. 
And from that moment on, there was never another whistle in the ice bowl. We played the entire ice bowl, listening to the commands of the referees saying, stop. Packers scored early. Terrible running conditions. Field is, was getting worse and worse and worse. And uh, the weather was really the, the number one thing that the Packers were fighting at that time, as were the Cowboys. The Cowboys take a lead late in the game. They're winning this damn game at Green Bay of all places. Final drive in the Ice Bowl, we're down three. We get the ball on the 35 yard line, four and a half minutes to go. In the previous 31 plays, we would gained a minus nine yards. 31 plays, the whole second half, maybe some more, we gained minus nine yards. We had made a first down in the whole second half. Watch the momentum change. Green Bay just came back and started to dominate play. In that huddle, I looked at my eyes of my teammates. I saw confidence. I saw poise and professionalism. I didn't see any fear, anxiety. I talked to Bart later and I said, what made you think you could take that team down the field? What were you thinking about? He said, I came in the huddle and I was going to say something. And I looked in your eyes, and I looked in Forrest's eyes, and I looked in Ski's eyes, I looked in Gilly's eyes. I said, I don't need to say anything. And then Bart stepped in and said, let's get this done. And everybody got an injection of power, of energy. The greatest drive I've ever seen in football was that drive, 68 yards. Donnie caught a little pass to begin the drive. I got a seven-yard runoff right tackle for first down. Donnie Anderson was sensational. Chuck Mercine played his heart out. I told Bart Starr that I was open in the left flat. He hit me for a 19-yard catch. I went out of bounds, stopped the clock. All of a sudden, I've got half the yardage in the drive. We need to get this ball in the end zone. I don't think that there was any doubt in anybody's mind that we had to, or otherwise it was over for us. Bart says to Ski in the huddle, he says, Ski, can you block Andre on the give play? And Ski says, run it, on two. And we gained 11 yards down to the one yard line. They call a couple of dive plays to our halfback to Donnie Anderson, number 44. Both times, Donnie slipped. So at the final timeout with 16 seconds to go, Bart went to the sidelines. I said, coach, I'm up underneath the center. I can lunge my way into the end zone. All he said was then run it and let's get the hell out of here. It wasn't a sneak. He didn't call a sneak. He called a handoff. The play was Brown Wright 31 wedge, which Chuck Mercine was supposed to get the ball. I was excited because here I was going to get a chance to win the game. An unbearable minus 13 degrees with a 36 below zero wind chill. Bart Starr finishes a 12 play 68 yard drive with a one yard touchdown quarterback sneak. The winning touchdown with 13 seconds remaining. He kept the ball. He didn't tell me, didn't tell anybody he was gonna keep the ball. I turned around and I saw Bart tumble into the end zone and he was across the line, right? And whew, we got it, we got it. My next fear was don't push him into the end zone because I couldn't stop. And if I pushed him or assisted him into the end zone, it would, would have been a penalty. So that's why I threw my arms up in the air, trying to say to the referee, I'm not assisting him as I bumped him. The Packers beat the Cowboys 21-17 in what is now famously remembered as the Ice Bowl. Tom Landry didn't ever think that Bart Starr would ever run with the ball, so he just turned and went right in. The season had been kind of difficult for Bart. It had been real frustrating at the early part of the season. The climax, like that, of scoring the thing, a great sense of relief for him. I know Bart was crying and very, very happy. Bart Starr has said many times about that last Ice Bowl drive, they used every bit of their experience and their wisdom that they built up through the years to orchestrate that championship. That's what Lombardi excelled at, because Lombardi willed victory. He tells you that if you give anything less than the best that you have within you at any time, regardless of the, the situation, regardless of the consequences, that uh, you're cheating yourself, you're cheating your teammates, you're cheating your professional football, you're cheating the fans who have made the game what it is today for you. Let's be honest. Even though that was a legendary team in 67 that won the Ice Bowl, that was not his best team. And maybe not the best team in the NFL that season. But they knew how to win. After the Ice Bowl, he came up 
to me and put his arm around me and said, you became a man today. That was the first real compliment that I received from him. I carried that the rest of my career, the next seven years. Herb Adderley came up to me one time and said, Lombardi came up to him after a game and said, you have just played the finest game I have ever seen a cornerback play, ever. Take that with you whenever you step on the field. So Herbie said, for the rest of my career, tried to play the finest game a cornerback had ever played. He would come out right, right past me, and he would slap me on my back, my, my shoulder, Fleming! And keep walking. And I would say, he touched me. He touched me. That was like the man touching you from the sky. Coach Lombardi was meeting with the team, and he really got after that team that day. He, he laid it out. He was had a horrible anger, you know, a temper. He could be charming. I'm gonna use the floor pass for this thing. <laughs> he was had all these facets that were, were all combined into what the real man was, and it was everything. I was sitting in this room adjacent to that at a little table there having lunch. He came in and he didn't see me. He put his head down on the desk and cried. He was pushing that team to, to Super Bowl II. He wanted it for them. The Packers beat the Oakland Raiders 33-14 to in Super Bowl II at the Orange Bowl in Miami. That game, the second Super Bowl, is almost a footnote compared to what the Ice Bowl is in history. I know I had this feeling right from the first series of uh, plays that we were on the field, that uh, we were out there ready to play the game. Coach had mentioned this might be our last time together. That would be the appropriate way for him to leave the game on the shoulders of his men. And he looks down and he says, let's head for the locker room, boys. It's a moment I'll cherish as long as I live. After nine seasons and five NFL championships, Lombardi resigns as head coach, but remains as general manager. All these things I covered, Lombardi and the Packers were the best of the bunch. After that great 67 season, he was completely burned out. Lombardi just had reached the point where he was exhausted. What more would he owe this city than five NFL titles in seven years? Marie said to me, you know, that Vince thought and realized that being head coach and general manager was too much. Lombardi chooses defensive assistant Phil Bankston as his replacement. Gentlemen, let me introduce to you now the new head coach of the Green Bay Packers, Mr. Phil Bankston. It was kind of like you let the air out of the balloon. And that's the only way I can explain it. That year of stepping aside being the general manager was tough for him. He missed the pursuit of excellence. That's what he was all about. He hated being away from the players. They actually had to soundproof the box up in the stadium where he was sitting because they didn't want the press to hear him screaming at Bengston's team. He had come down to the practice field and he did that very seldom, but he was sitting there looking out over the practice. I think he could see that his dynasty had started to crumble and was eroded. It was not what he hoped it would be. One year after introducing his successor, Vince Lombardi resigns from the Green Bay Packers. I was with Marie and she said, oh, Father DuPoe, Vince made a terrible mistake. I don't know whether he was tired out or whether he'd had enough. I know he wanted part ownership of the Packers. You can't do that in Green Bay. Nobody owns the Packers. The Packers Board of Directors vote to release General Manager Lombardi from his contract so he can become head coach, executive vice president, and part owner of the Washington Redskins. Packers Executive Committee could have made it very difficult for him and demanded certain things, you know, money or 
players in return for letting Lombardi go. And Olenicic loved Lombardi so much that he said you can't put a price tag on it, and it would be beneath him to do that. The day he walked out the door and went to the Washington Redskins, it was never the same. They put him on a pedestal in Washington. I mean, I guarantee you he was as big as the president was in Washington. He was our beating heart, and uh, our heart just didn't beat as well as it did before, once he was gone. Somebody said he made football players out of some men, and he made men out of some football players. I think he's much more proud of the fact that he made some men out of football players. People don't know Coach Lombardi, and they don't know who he is. They don't know anything about him. We know him. We understand him, and we love him. This is one beautiful man. One afternoon, we were practicing, and Lombardi said, fellas, take your shoulder pads off and helmets off and put them aside. And I put mine by this big old scaffolding in a big tower in the middle of our practice field, and then went back to practice, and it started to drizzle. I said, boy, I gotta get my shoulder pads and helmet on before they get all wet. I ran over by this tower and put the shoulder pads on, put my helmet on, and all of a sudden, Wind came through this practice field and knocked this tower down. Boom, knocked me down. I was there, boy, a bolt went through the, my helmet and I could just feel it hit my shoulder and I'm lying flat on my back. The guys are come running over and Lombardi says, who is it? One of the guys said, hey, it's co coach, it's, it's Nitschke. Lombardi says, let's get back to practice. <laughs> <laughs> now, he knew I could take those big hits. <laughs>